Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Demers. I'm the communications director here at the New Hampshire Insurance Department, and I appreciate you all joining us for this webinar on emergency preparedness and flood insurance. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Keith Nyan, our director of consumer services, uh, James Fox, our director of property and casualty, and Deputy Commissioner DJ Betancourt. Uh, before I turn it over to uh, Commissioner Betancourt, I just want to do uh, one quick housekeeping item, and that is to let you know that uh, we're happy to entertain questions at the end of the event. So please use the chat box to type your questions in, and we'll address those at the end. Uh, having said that, we appreciate your attendance, and I'll turn it over to uh, DJ Betancourt. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon. We really appreciate you joining us for this very important and timely discussion. As Andrew mentioned, my name is DJ Betancourt, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Deputy Commissioner of the New Hampshire Insurance Department. As you know, the last month has been a difficult one in New Hampshire because of flooding in large areas of our state. I've been at this department for over two and a half years, and the conversations that I have had with consumers over the last three weeks have been some of the most difficult that I have experienced. We have heard from residents who have suffered severe damage to their homes or have lost their homes entirely and are facing the prospect of having to rebuild their lives with no coverage from their insurance carrier. In most instances, residents didn't appreciate that their underlying homeowners coverage did not cover flood events and that they needed to have separate flood insurance coverage. Everyone in New Hampshire lives in an area with some flood risk, and our colleagues at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services has noted that flooding is New Hampshire's most common and costly natural disaster. We're going to share some information with you this afternoon about flood insurance, what it covers, where to get it, and the different options that are available. In terms of my comments, the most frequent response that I hear from people regarding flood insurance is that it's expensive. And while I do appreciate the fact that the cost may vary depending on the location of the home, according to InsureFi, the average cost of flood insurance in New Hampshire is a little over $1,000 per year. And that breaks down to $92 a month. And if that price seems high, let me share with you another statistic. According to FEMA, as little as one inch of flood water can cause up to $25,000 in damage. And therefore, I think it puts that cost for flood insurance into some important perspective. However, we believe that an even more important consideration is this question. If, you, if your home was completely lost in a flood, would you have the financial resources to replace everything you would lose? I think for most people, that's going to be a very, very daunting task. And so that concludes my introductory thoughts. I'm going to turn it over to our team of experts, James Fox and Keith Nyan. Thank you. James, you're on mute. So, thank you, Commissioner. I'm always on mute. Um, so uh, I'm the PNC director at the at the department, and I thought what I would do um, when I was kind of thinking this through in my head is I thought I'd just take a step back and maybe just explain um, a homeowner's policy to people so they really understand how it works. Because um, you know it, it can be a little like, oh, flood's not covered, but like, hey, why isn't it covered? So how? So we're talking about the property um, coverage in your homeowner's policy. So the property coverage in your homeowner's policy applies and gives you coverage for what's called direct physical loss. So that's what's called your coverage grant. So if you have a, if you if your home is damaged uh, or the contents of your home, you're going to get coverage for direct physical loss. So that that's the that's the big trigger that they give you. And then after that, the insurance company has. Um, exclusions and, and conditions that, that basically limits that coverage uh, trigger. So one of the, the major um, exclusions uh, when you're dealing with a storm, so not to, to, you know, there's no exclusion for storm. So there is coverage for storms. It's the elements of the storm that you have to look at. So for example, what would be covered if, there's, if the storm has wind and the wind tears shingles off your roof, that will most likely be covered. And the reason I say most likely in these instances is this is a contractually based um, coverage. So it's, it's, it's controlled by contract. Whereas, for example, fire, so the, the, the peril of fire, if your house burns, that's controlled by a statute. So that it, there's much less um, ability to change that by contract. But for a storm event, it, it's much more contractual. So you need to look at your particular policy. But one of the major 
um, exclusions within the policy uh, is for is is the water damage exclusion. And I, I think the best way to, to, to look at this, we're going to go through it, but the best way to look at this is if, if a particular water damage is likely on, on, on the macro to damage many, many homes, the insurance company um, is concerned about taking that on because they have solvency issues. Um, so if you had a, say if you had a flood that flooded uh, every town in the state of New Hampshire and you, the insurance companies would have a hard time handling that. So what they do is they put in an exclusion for and I look at a typical ISO one. So that that's like one that's many companies use. ISO is a, a general company that provides policies to um, insurance companies. So they, they exclude flood, surface water, waves, tidal water, overflow from a body of water and and uh, water driven by wind. So basically what they're, they're, they're trying to say in many ways is possible that they're not going to cover a flood. And then so that's uh, above ground. And then also they then also say water below the surface that puts pressure on your house that damages your house like leaks through your basement. They're also not going to cover that um, for the same reason that, that there's a concern about the um, the exposure, the, the magnitude of the exposure. So that is not covered if you had. So this is a typical homeowner's policy, but if you have a, a, an ensuing, say, a, a fire occurs and the fire would be covered. So that's because that fire policy is really and also an explosion. Those kind of things are covered. So you say to yourself, well, I can't then I don't have coverage. And that's true. But then what the federal government does, and this isn't just in, in the area of flood, but they they step in and then they have the National Flood Insurance Program. And so that is a, a, a separate um, policy, but you can either a get it from um FEMA directly, they're called National Flood Insurance uh, Program Direct, or you can get it from several, several uh, insurance companies that it's called Write Your Own. They will write the policy for you as part of the program, and then you will then um, get rated and then you get your bill as a, as the commissioner said. And so it, that is something you should consider, you know, your, uh, how risk averse you are. Uh, and now there, the, there are, are limits. So the limits, as the commissioner said, for flood insurance, the, the, the top end for the, the building uh, is 250000 And then for contents, it's $100,000. Uh, There's slightly more for commercial. But for for uh, homeowners, that, that's your, the maximum you can get from the National Flood Insurance Program. So, uh, And then the other thing you can't get from them is uh, loss of use. So if you had to go out and um, get a hotel room because you couldn't stay in your house, they, they don't cover that piece. So because of that, some of the limitations uh, on the National Flood Insurance Program. And, you know, just to be clear, the National Flood Insurance Program, if you called them, they would tell you, I think they would tell you it's available in every every town in the state of New Hampshire. And the requirements are basically that it's a real house. It's got to have walls and a foundation and a roof. And then basically they'll write it for you and they'll price it. Uh, but sometimes people who have, um, you know, more expensive homes think, well, $250,000, that's not going to be enough for me. So they don't, they don't want to be in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, we, although the National Flood Insurance Program covers about 90% of the flood policies that are issued. So, but then recently, uh, probably since 2015, there's been a new um, way to get flood insurance. It's called the private flood insurance market. So these, again, not, not now we're, we're back out of uh, a federal program and we're back with insurance companies who are, uh, you know, a, able to take on the risk. And there, there are several of them that are able to take on the pl private flood insurance risk. Um, I believe Chubb comes to mind who, who do that. So basically, so you could get limits in the private flood insurance program that could go up to, I know I saw um, one that's up to $15 million. So you can you can therefore have an insurance company cover your risk at a much higher level. Now, part of that, because now we're out of a, a national program and we're in um, private private insurance, they might be, and this isn't mandatory insurance, so they might be, um, their underwriting rules and like whether they're going to um, write it might be a little more, a little, little tighter. Exactly how, what type of house is it? You know, all kind of that thing, that kind of stuff. Um, now, if it's just a location issue, they can't not write you. But um, you, you know, it may be more expensive in the private if you're having a really high, a high end house in a very dangerous uh, area. It could get very expensive, as opposed to the National Flood Insurance Program, which is, uh, as the commissioner said, very reasonable. Um, and then the other thing that is a pro if you're in the private insurance uh, arena is that you do get uh, you will get loss of use. So if you have to if you have to move out of your house, which might, very likely might happen, um, the private insurance companies will pay for you to basically live somewhere else. So I think, you know, if, if you know, the way to do this is a you should look at your current um, 
policy and see and with maybe your producer, your insurance agent, and see um, how water uh, damage is handled and to and how the depth and breadth of the exclusion. So some some might say anything directly or indirectly related to this, you know, depends on the language. So you want to look at your current homeowner's policy, and then you also want to access your risk for flood. And then if you're concerned, then you might want to, you know, look at, you know, the National Flood Insurance Program, because usually I would say a flood doesn't usually, you know, destroy your house. I mean, it usually just damages, damages it. Um, so, you know, for a lot of people, the NFIP is fine. It's very reasonably priced. And then if that, if you have a higher end house, then I would say you should probably look at private flood insurance and see what your options are there. Um, and that, that's the way I would say to look at it and go kind of just circle back to storm. A lot of storm damage that's not flood um, and not water is um, it would be covered. And then and just to totally uh, finish off the water damage, you know, if you have a, a, a pipe that bursts in your house, that's not a flood. You, you're going to get you get coverage for that. So um, it's really the, the concern, I would say, for the insurance companies is the large you know on the on the abc cbs the large news of a real flood that could um damage many many homes and then uh, put the um, ability of the insurance companies to say solvent at risk that they don't want to take those risks on um so that's what i would say is an overview of um insurance policies and in, return in in relation to st um, storms uh again i would say if, if you have any questions you can always give me a call uh, at the insurance department, I'd be happy to talk to you, uh, but I'll hand it over to Keith, who's going to talk about preparedness, I believe. Uh, thank you very much, James. I just wanted to add one thing, uh, which is uh, flood insurance is available to individuals who may not live in private homes, but who rent apartments or condominiums. So there are other types of flood policies which are capped at, I believe it's $100,000. So um, it is not an exclusive product to individuals own their own homes. So, all right, beyond that, I just wanted to talk about that we are certainly encouraging uh, individuals to purchase flood insurance. As it was mentioned at the top of this webinar, um, encouraging all New Hampshire residents to reach out to their agents and review what is actually in their policy, what's covered and what is not, and to ask those questions as to whether or not an individual, um, whether or not for that individual, that individual should be purchasing flood insurance. We certainly recommend it. Um, and keep in mind that the for those who don't live in a floodplain who may be living in areas where there are less risk, um, the premium is going to reflect that risk. Lower risk, lower premiums, and it isn't necessarily cost prohibitive for the average homeowner to purchase flood insurance. Um, I want to make sure I touched upon all the things I needed to. Was there something else, uh, James, that you needed me to cover? Um, you know, I would just say, you know, and, and on the front end, if you're going to have a storm, you know, and, and I know that we have um, documents, I believe, on our website that say, you know, you should take pictures of, of what's in your home. I mean, oh, there's sure. a lot of things that you can do before um, a storm hits to kind of document where you're at. So let's say you have a flood and you do have a fire that happens after the flood. There's not a lot to look at after that. So um, you need to kind of I would say one of the most important things people go, go, go through is, is document. Um, what's in your home. So there's not uh, going to be a dispute about what you're claiming for the loss, because if there is the dispute, uh, the insurance companies have a right to have a right to basically do an examination of you um, to determine whether they're going to believe you or not. So a lot of that upfront preparation, which we have a lot of stuff on the website about, is super important for for people to, to do before the storm hits. Be prepared, get your insurance before do all the preparation you can do from emergency exits, all kinds of stuff before the storm. Don't don't wait and be doing like don't be after the storm saying, boy, I wish I had done that. So that no, it's, I, it's I, I certainly up. think that's appropriate. You know, it's interesting as I had done a webinar recently and I failed to mention that, which is there are several apps that are that are available either through the Google Play Store or the uh, App Store in on the Apple platform. Uh, a home inventory app is absolutely uh, critical as someone's preparing for a flood. And it's it's a pretty simple process to download the app, walk through your home, record videos, take pictures, inventory uh, property that it could potentially be damaged, not just in a flood, but certainly in um, any sort of situation, such as a fire or other catastrophe. Um, absolutely imperative that you have that inventory done prior to there being an incident. 
if an individual is is doing an inventory um, the old fashioned way, writing it down on paper, you know, we certainly encourage folks to store those documents somewhere other than their home. It could be a friend's home, could be that of a parent, could be scanning those documents and uploading them to the cloud. Um, but making sure you have all of those important documents, not just insurance records, but bank statements, um, prescriptions, any sort of important information that you are going to need to sustain yourself um, while you're dislocated, absolutely take those precautions. Um, and then it's probably uh, pertinent for me to also say that we certainly encourage folks to follow some basic protocols, which is have a plan. If you're uh, potentially going to experience a disruption from your home, again, flood or fire, have an evacuation plan, have, have a a location where you can meet other family members in the event that not everybody's exiting at the same time or from the uh, same egress point. So have a plan, plan ahead, do your inventories. And certainly if you have any questions or concerns um, about coverage, Mr. Fox is here to help you out here in the Consumer Services Division. We take great pride in helping people and we can certainly um, direct you to the proper resources, whether it be FEMA, um, ourselves here to the private um, insurance agents. Give us a call if you have any questions and we're happy to guide you to the right place. And the last thing I would like to just add to this is that um, FEMA runs the National Flood Insurance Program. So I, I would caution people, don't think if your house floods and a few other houses flood that FEMA is going to be there um, separate from the flood insurance program to provide coverage for your flood. Now, the reason they have the flood, and pro flood insurance program is because that there's no guarantee that there's going to be a disaster declared and all the steps that have to go through for them to maybe help you out with that. So I would say it's it's much more prudent to get a flood insurance program than to expect that FEMA is going to be there for you. And with regard to home inventories, I've put in the chat box a link to a webinar that we did here at the department last month uh, with Keith, and um, it discusses the home inventory process in detail, and uh, it's only 15 minutes, so we encourage you to click on the link uh, and view that webinar, um, as well as some of our other content there uh, on our YouTube channel, including our uh, podcast and, uh, and other videos. Um, Donald Funstein has a question. Uh, can it be added as an endorsement, or does it have to be in a separate policy? Well, you know, if it's uh, if it's private flood insurance, you know, it, it could be it could be added as an endorsement. But if you're going through the National Flood Insurance Program, that is, you know, it's it, the insurance company writes it. But my understanding is a separate it's a separate uh, policy that's through NFIP. NFIP is really writing all of them. Um, and if you're in the NFIP. And I would just add to that, uh, first of all, James and Keith have done a phenomenal job here, but just a point of emphasis. So as folks have heard, you really have two big options. You can either use the National Flood Insurance Program or you could seek out coverage in the private market. We strongly encourage Granite Staters to use a local independent insurance agent. They're going to be able to help you navigate the process and determine the best coverage for you given your specific circumstances and given your particular budget. So make use of that resource. They, they are there to help you uh, understand what you need given your circumstances and get you in the best coverage uh, possible for you. Um, it looks like Mar is typing another question and uh, we just want to encourage you, you know, we've got a few moments. So if you have a question, please type that into the chat box and we'll address that. Uh, Mara asks, as climate change fuels heavier rain in New Hampshire, should people be thinking about flood insurance differently than we have historically? Um, and I'm just going to start out uh, the answer by saying, um, you know, our, our position here is that I think a lot of people misunderstand or perhaps better put, they under uh, they underestimate their exposure to floods. They think, well, you know, geographically or topographically, I'm I'm in a in an elevated place, or I'm not near a, a traditional, you know, the seacoast or a, a big river. Um, but I think, as recent storms illustrate, um, you know, these are catastrophic events, and so you need to be thinking about the event of catastrophe, right? Not oh, well, we normally don't flood. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that's not why you have insurance for normal everyday things. It's for catastrophes, and so we would encourage you. Um, to think about it in, in that context. But um, with regard to climate change fueling, uh, fueling heavier rains, and should we think about it differently than we have historically? Um, 
you know, these are our hundred year events. Uh, I, I heard the other day it put like, you know, every year that goes on without a flood uh, of catastrophic consequence, the chances mathematically increase that it will happen sooner, right? And so perhaps that's one way to look at it. Um, James and Keith, I'm sure you have other thoughts there and I'll turn that over to you. Well, I think, you know, Commissioner Betancourt kind of struck a very key point early on, um, which is each individual needs to um, assess his or her own financial um, limits and look at what the risks are and whether or not uh, he or she can recover from that flood. Um, the cost of a flood insurance policy for someone who is, you know, not in an area of high risk is going to be quite affordable. And obviously the risks of having a flood and the uh, sheer cost and magnitude of recovering from that flood is going to be fairly significant. So um, it's an individual risk assessment and we highly encourage individuals to uh, look into it. Yeah, I, I would only add, add that, you know, um, you know, in PNC land, these are these are these are fortuitous acts that we're dealing with. So, you know, a lot of people buy auto insurance every year and never have an accident their whole life. So, um, you know, I don't I don't know if it's it's really so much the um, the increased risk. I mean, I think that there's always been a risk there. And I think, you know, if, if you want to if you want to be prudent, you, you should have uh, uh, flood insurance unless you're absolutely confident that. Um, maybe you've had your land surveyed that is impossible for your land to, to flood, but, um, you know, things also also change, you know, maybe you are on a part of a mountain and someone above you cuts trees down and all of a sudden you've gone from never having a flood to you don't know it and the flood comes right down and right into your house. So, um, you know, which is, again, most people think they're never going to get in a car accident, but they have car insurance. So um, you could be at quite at risk if you decide not to have flood insurance. I would just add, I think James just made a very important point there, Mara. I think obviously climate change has to be something that everybody considers and how they best protect themselves given that, given that phenomena. But to James's point, as there are areas of the state that are developing in different ways, that could very well change the dynamic in a particular neighborhood, a particular community. So you've got to be aware of those things as well. Uh, in the interim of any more questions, I've put our contact info for uh, our consumer services department in the chat window, and we encourage you to copy that down. And if you have any questions, whether it's um, regarding floods or storms or whether it's any other issues that our consumer team can help you with, we're standing by and we encourage you to copy that down. Uh, Katie has a question. The New Hampshire floodplain management program within the New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development is the state coordinating agency of the NFIP in New Hampshire. I sent a question. Uh, she's happy to provide additional information on the program can be found on their website. Katie, we very much appreciate you um, sharing that information with our viewers. Uh, we encourage you to click on that link uh, and to look into the floodplain management program if you want a little bit more information on that and uh, how to reach the NFIP folks uh, in New Hampshire. If there's no other questions, I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Bencourt, but certainly not before uh, putting in a plug for our social media and uh, particularly our YouTube page, where we have uh, a lot of good content going up. Uh, we're doing uh, this webinar series monthly, and we um, encourage you to sign up on our email list. Um, I've been told we uh, have the right balance of emails in terms of uh, uh, information and frequency, so we try not to uh, spam your inbox, but we do notify you of important information, uh, whether it's via press release or uh, an informational webinar like this, and check out our YouTube page uh, for more videos uh, like this. We have short videos, uh, some longer webinars, uh, various topics, whether they're of interest to consumers, regulators, regulated ent entities, uh, legislators. We've got a wide variety of material for all different kinds of people. Um, with that, we thank you, and I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Bencourt for final thoughts. Well, thank you, Andrew. And again, I want to thank Keith and James for their participation today, and I want to thank everybody for, for joining us in this important conversation. I want to acknowledge the fact that these are not easy things to talk about. People don't want to think about what might happen in a catastrophe, but you're going to want to take the time as difficult as it may be, to really assess whether or not you have adequate protection, adequate coverage for yourself, so that God forbid the day comes when you're confronted 
with one of these tragedies, you're not having to rebuild your life from scratch. So hopefully some of the information that we've given you today is helpful as you think through that process. Uh, but I look forward to seeing everybody next month for our next webinar. Thank you so much.